On November the 8th, 1892, a devastating attack on another young girl left the residents of Blackburn reeling. And this attack came less than 20 years after another horrific murder here in Blackburn. But what does one red handkerchief have to do with the story? This, my friends, is the tragic tale of Alice Barnes. On November the 8th, 1892, Alice herself had left school and made her way back home at Redland Farm. Now, her daily chores were to help the family with the cows. And it was here, in Witton, where she used to bring the cows themselves just to graze. Now, on the afternoon when a sequence of events would unravel, Alice had left the farm. After a short while, Alice's father, Edward, sent his son and Alice's brother down to see what was taking Alice so long. And as Thomas ran down Bunce Lane, hoping to see his sister, there was a crowd of people all congregated around this. Well, it was an object to Thomas at the time. Now, as he got closer to where this crowd of people were, he soon realised that these people were actually standing round a body. Now inquisitive Thomas, he went over and it was instantly shocked to see that this soul, this poor body, this poor lifeless body, was that of his sister Alice. Now obviously over the years, all the landscape has changed dramatically and this would not have looked anything like this back when Alice was nine years old. We've got a school, we've got a college, we've got a running track, we've got allotments on our left hand side. But this is the area where she would have brought all the cattle. Like I said, probably seven days a week. Now on the day of her attack, we know she left school, like I said, and she went back to her farm at Redlam. And we'll put some overlays on of where her farm once was. It is now a housing estate. Myself and Vicky drove up there, I think it was two, maybe three years ago, when we did the podcast of this very same story. So we're not going to travel up there again. Instead, what we'll do, we'll put overlays on, and we'll put some Google Map images on of where Redlam Farm used to be. We're going to go towards Bunce Lane now. I'm going to talk more about the crime itself and what happened back on November the 8th, 1892. Now this is part of Witton Park. It's kind of on the outer boundaries. And obviously a lot has changed in over 100 years since Alice would have roamed in these parts. But there's a lane just on, or when I say a lane, there's an old path which is just past this perimeter fence. And that wall there, would have been in situ over 100 years ago and the path itself Alice would have walked down many many times whilst bringing the cows down from her house or the farm at Redlam. Now as you can see there's all these metal fences and everything else put in place to stop people getting down there but it is good to see that there's some remnants of the past still there and like I said that wall and this pathway would have been there 100 years ago when Alice herself would have walked numerous times in her short lived life. The path where Alice would have come out, and I'll take you guys down to it because this is interesting, I think it would have ended up being here. And as you'll see just in the distance, I don't think the GoPro actually will pick it up, but just in the distance there are many greenhouses, and allotment patches. 
But just in front of me are these gate posts. So we know now that this path and where we were looking just further up there, this path would have led around and to the entrance to the gates where Alice herself would have been attacked all those years ago. But I'm really, really happy to actually find some actual evidence, some historical evidence that this is indeed the path and the gateway where Alice herself would have come with the cattle on more than one occasion. This has really surprised me because I didn't expect to find anything like this today. But this is validation, like I said, of what went on well over 100 years ago. Now where Alice herself were killed just off Bunce Lane, which is probably five minutes away in that direction, we know now that there were some wooden uh, gates or fences which had to be pushed open to allow entry into Whitton Park. So it's going to be a similar looking structure to what we've got at this end, because we are at the opposite side of, of where Bunce Lane would have been. But like I said, Bunce Lane's in that direction. So if we can imagine these two structures being on the other road but with big doorways which had to be pushed this like i said it kind of does back up what we should be finding on the opposite side so like i said guys i'm really really happy to to find these what i always find fascinating when myself and vicky who is just stood over there what i find interesting about when we come across things like this is the stories we cover, even though they are dark and the remnants of the past are still here to remind us of those dark times, it does make you wonder how many times young Alice herself will, maybe, or has touched this gatepost. We have to remember she was only nine years old when her life was cruelly taken and there was a lot of responsibility on not just Alice's head but on young kids' heads back in those days, you know, to tend to family needs and to help the family at such a young age. And Alice, she had the responsibility of bringing the cattle down into these pastures, into these fields all those years ago. So she may well have come down at some point, opened these gates, let the cattle through, and then she may have just leaned on here. She might have rested her hand on it like I'm doing, talking to people. She might have sat here. She might have actually sat on this itself and leaned on it. But the history is there. And I'm, like I said, I'm not going on about it, but I am so pleased that we found these gateposts. And it does, um, it does feel nice to, to tie something up to the crime of what happened in 1892. Just in front of us is the old, I think it's called the Witten Stocks Bridge. And we do have a photograph of two young boys playing on that exact bridge. Now we are gonna have a quick walk around and get to the back and I'll take you guys to it. Now from this direction, from Bunce Lane, it is inaccessible. They have actually fenced it all off now. But you can see there is just the outer wall just here of where the footpath used to be to take you to the bridge itself. So we're just walking down what was originally Spring Lane and it's here where we know for a fact that Alice used to bring the cows from her Redland farm. And what she would have done, she would have walked along this old pathway, made her way up Spring Lane and then onto Bunter Lane and to where the fields at Whitton Park used to be. Now for historical context, this is the old bridge where witnesses at the time would later say they saw a strange man lurking in and around this area. And we do have a photograph of two boys actually on this bridge 
Now it's all changed over the years and as you can see um, this wall is completely different but there used to be like a bigger wall on that side which curved around and there were some gates there. Now I'm thinking Alice's body was found just at the top of this embankment so there would have been a path round to the left and just up to the top where it flattens out where the two large gate posts would have been and that is where Alice herself would have been found but many many people came along this old footbridge back in the 1800s and it used to lead also in that direction to Bunce Lane but there's two paths there's this path on the right but more certainly the one on the left so it is amazing how this structure is still here after all these years albeit very difficult to get to but it's still another poignant reminder of what happened way back in 1892 and like I said there were plenty of witnesses there were at least two witnesses who were on this bridge on the day of the murder itself so this is a better angle of that old photograph and I'll superimpose it as I'm talking but you'll see the two boys actually stood here on the bridge and the wall kind of curves around to the left just past where the wooden fencing is now um, like I said it has all changed now we know for a fact that Alice didn't herd the cows up this direction because it would have been just too steep but her body was most definitely found just beyond those trees on the flat side just at the top and leading towards Bunce Lane and the old Whitton Park so this is at the opposite side of where we were in Whitton Park and it's here where we believe where Alice's body was discovered by Martha Hindle now from all accounts there were two huge gates here with wooden frames set back and it's when Martha Hindle pushed the actual gates open that is when the body of Alice was discovered now the thing is the footbridge itself is just on the on the is it hillside would you say of of this plateau here but we think like I said that it was this area now when we put maps over and we overlay it you'll see that the X is firmly inside this land here and it's the X where Alice's body was later discovered like I said by Martha Hindle now the reason why I say this we feel is the location like I said we do have maps of this area from the 1800s but we also have a crime scene sketch which clearly shows where the gates were and it does point to this area just here and the road to our right is Bunce Lane so now this this is Bunce Lane as we know it today now obviously this is all changed over the years and this would have been more of a dirt path one would think and Whitton Park is just on that side of the actual road itself so we think Alice would have brought the cows up the old Bunce Lane and then deviated left through some gates and into Whitton Park but it's these gates here on this side of Bunce Lane which obviously no longer exist but it is definitely here where like I keep saying where her body will be discovered later by Martha Hindle so after young Thomas has obviously come across the body of his sister lying in the road he's run back to his farm to fetch his father Edward so both Edward and Thomas have made the way back down Bunce Lane and obviously he's identified that this poor soul is that of his daughter but what of the actual crime and the scene itself? Now, from all accounts, once Martha Hindle had come across the body of young Alice, she's gone and fetched help, and help came, the police arrived, and so did a Dr Wheatley. Now, it was when Dr Wheatley was examining Alice's body on the ground, he noticed something red protruding from her mouth. When he'd opened her mouth, he'd seen that something had been stuffed deep, deep inside her throat and he's then proceeded to remove this object and now this object was a red patterned handkerchief so this was obviously a major clue as to who may have committed this crime but obviously it was now finding the person who had done this now Alice's body was taken quickly to Duckworth Street and to where the police station used to be where obviously a coroner would be waiting and obviously an examination of the body itself would take place now from all accounts and thankfully Alice was never sexually assaulted it seems that whoever had committed this crime may have been disturbed and so he kind of stopped in his tracks 
This red handkerchief was obviously used to muffle her screams, but in the process it would lead to her death. Now the interesting thing about the red handkerchief is, Martha Hindle, the first person at the scene of the crime, if she had noticed this red handkerchief protruding from her mouth and she'd have removed it, Alice herself may well have lived, she may well have survived. Now this isn't to blame Martha Hindle in any, in any way, shape or form. Al, uh, Martha herself panicked and she went for help. But if only she'd have seen this handkerchief sticking out from her mouth and she'd have, and she'd have removed the handkerchief, there's a good chance that Alice herself would have survived this horrific attack. So who was culpable for the murder of Alice Barnes? Now it seems that one name in particular kept being mentioned a lot in the early investigation. And that name was Cross Duckworth, who was a 31 year old married father of two. And he lived only 10 minutes away from where this tragic crime took place. Now Cross Duckworth himself apparently was a heavy drinker and on the day of the murders he was seen in several local public houses and he was highly intoxicated from all accounts. Now when it came to his arrest and further investigations into his whereabouts on the afternoon of the attack, it seems that the two children who were on the bridge at the time would point crossed up without from a lineup that the police had arranged and they pointed him out as being the man they had seen acting suspiciously close to or on the bridge, like I said, on that afternoon of the, the murder itself. Now, when the police went to Cross Duckworth's house to arrest him and to take him in for questioning, they also found some incriminating evidence. Not only did they find fabric that resembled the red handkerchief that was found placed inside young Alice's mouth, they also asked him where his boots were. Now these boots themselves would prove incriminating because it seems that when the police were doing the investigations at the scene where Alice Barnes' body was found, they found fresh boot prints in the soil. Now an artist was called in at the time and he took a print of that actual boot itself, the mark and the imprint in the soil. The outline, the features and the studs of the boots loosely resembled those found on Cross Duckworth's boots themselves. So the police had some evidence to put Cross Duckworth at the scene on that same day. Now the other piece of important evidence which the police came across was obviously the red handkerchief that was placed into young Alice's throat at the time. And when the police went to Cross Duckworth's house, not only did they find the boots kind of matched the sketch that the artist had drawn, drawn at the time. They also found fabric resembling that of the handkerchief that, like I said, was found in Alice's throat. The police believed they had their man. After all, the boots, the red handkerchief, they all pointed to Cross being in that area when this crime was committed. What wouldn't help Cross Duckworth would be a lineup the next day when the children themselves who had seen this strange character acting oddly on the bridge, they would point out Cross Duckworth as being the man they had found loitering in that area on the day of Alice's attack. So Cross Duckworth himself, he would deny all knowledge into the attack on Alice Barnes, but he would admit to being in and around the area on the day of the attack itself. But as far as the police were concerned, it was an open and shut case by now. They had their man and they had enough evidence to charge him with the willful murder of 
Alice Barnes. On December the 12th, 1892, Cross stuck with Wood face trial at the Liverpool Assizes for the willful murder of young Alice Barnes. Now, he would always maintain his innocence throughout, and it was a two-day trial. But even leading up to the trial, and from the day he was arrested, he always maintained complete innocence. But with the red handkerchief, with the boot prints, and obviously being pinpointed from a line-up as being the man seen on or near the bridge on the day of the crime, everything pointed to Cross Duckworth being the guilty person. Now, the two-day trial, it ended, and a guilty verdict was placed upon Cross Duckworth, and he would be sentenced to death by hanging. Now, over the course of the next month, he would always maintain his innocence, and his family, his wife and his two children, would often visit him in prison. And he would be relaxed, he would be calm about the situation, and after all, an appeal had been set up, and it was sent to the Home Secretary at the time, asking to have Cross Duckworth's death sentence rescinded. The Home Secretary declined this request, and Cross Duckworth himself would be hung in January of 1893. Now, leading up to the actual hanging itself, the night before the hanging, Cross Duckworth maintained an aura of calmness. He, he had his meal, his last meal, absolutely fine, the day on the morning of his execution. He went to sleep the night before, absolutely fine. He was completely unawares as to what was going on from all accounts. It was like he just wouldn't accept it and that everything would be okay. Now, the moments leading up to his execution and from the reports we've read, it seems that Cross Duckworth's demeanour changed dramatically in the last final few moments. And it was only minutes before the executioner came into his cell to pinion him, that is when he seemed to go into a relapse and crossed up with himself. He didn't speak, he was shaking, he was quivering, and it was like he wasn't in the room. His body may have been in the room, but his mind was elsewhere. And from all accounts, even when they took him to where the trapdoors were, he went calmly, he went, he went easy enough. He didn't kick up a fight, he wasn't trying to get away from anybody. It was just like not accepting his fate, but not realising what was about to happen. Now when the trap doors finally opened and he fell to his death and to meet his maker, one could argue, it didn't come as a shock to many people locally. After all, the police had the men, or had the right man. But did they? We're going to get to an important aspect of this case shortly, and one that could blow it wide open, because a year later, in 1894, two letters will be received by Cross Duckworth's wife, proclaiming to be from the actual killer of Alice Barnes. Four days after the death of Alice Barnes, her funeral would take place here at St Leonard's in the little village of Balderstone. Hundreds of people came out to line the streets to pay their final respects and to be sympathetic to the Barnes family. The cortege would make its way along the tiny, narrow lanes before arriving here mid-afternoon in November of 1892. And young Alice would be interred just in the corner of the graveyard just over there. And we're going to visit her grave shortly. But poor nine-year-old Alice Barnes, she had a life to live. She would be missed severely by her family and friends. And it will be here where her body will be finally laid to rest. So this is the final resting place of young Alice Barnes. And on the inscription on the headstone, it simply says, in loving memory of Alice Barnes, who was born July the 15th, 1883, and fell asleep in Jesus, November 8th, 1892. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thee 
love to, to me, but I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Also Sarah E. Barnes, who died May 15th, 1914, aged 87, I think it says. Or is it 67? Aged 67. And Edward, her beloved husband, who died 1928, aged 75. So young Alice is actually interred now with both her parents, Sarah and Edward, which is nice and fitting. But young Alice Barnes, she was nine years old when she sadly lost her life. Now in 1894, a letter arrived with Cross Duckworth's wife, proclaiming to be from the Witten murderer himself. And he would detail how the police knew that Cross Duckworth was innocent and that this guy, this person who wrote this letter, felt truly sorry for Cross Duckworth's execution and for the pain his family had to go through. He would write in detail about what happened on that day and that how he intended to kill the young girl with his pocket knife and then throw her body into the brook. But he was disturbed by the sound of footsteps. He was also basically go on to say that the police themselves, like I said, knew Cross Duckworth was innocent, but it was the fact that they needed to find the culpable person or anybody who they could pin it on. Now, it was just unfortunate for Cross Duckworth that they found this red handkerchief that many other men like him would have had in their possessions back in 1892 or this same kind of fabric. It was also unfortunate that Cross Duckworth's boots were again, just like the handkerchief, an extremely popular and common piece of footwear, piece of attire, and that the actual stub prints were probably one, like many hundreds, just like it. Cross Duckworth, like I said, admitted to being in and around the area at the time of the killing. He admitted to being drunk at the time, but it still doesn't make him a murderer. Now, I'm not here to say that Cross Duckworth is 100% innocent. All I am saying is, even though some of the evidence might point towards him being the murderer, these two letters, because there were two letters that Cross Duckworth's wife received, one of them, I think, went to the Blackburn or the Burnley Express, whilst the other one was delivered directly to her house. But both letters, both basically said the same. They were both written by the same hand, but they both went into detail about what was going to happen to young Alice or to a young person at the time, how he was going to kill that person with a pocket knife and how he had to kind of keep her quiet by forcing the handkerchief into her mouth, how he was going to throw it into the brook and the, the brook itself does go around as you see in the old photograph with the two boys on the bridge. This person also said he was fleeing the country to start a new life in the United States of America. And he, these letters themselves came from Southampton, so quite far away. So we have to now question, did the police get the right man? Or did they know Cross Duckworth was innocent, but everything pointed towards him, so it was an easy target? It really is a strange and bizarre ending to this tragic tale of young Alice Barnes. Not only do we have the death of a young girl, but we also might have the death of an innocent man. You've also then got Martha Hindle, the person who found young Alice lying pretty much lifeless in the actual entrance to the Whitton Park itself. And you do think to yourself, if only she'd have checked the body more carefully and she'd have seen this red piece of cloth coming out of her mouth, if she'd have removed that cloth, Alice herself more than likely would have survived. Cross Duckworth may have been found guilty, but in the longer term, he may have just got penal servitude. He may have had to just serve time in prison, hard labour. So again, an innocent man may have lost his life for something he didn't do. It really is a sad, sad ending. Now, whether or not these letters themselves are true, we will never know. They may well have been written by somebody who just wanted a bit of attention, but why would somebody, a year or two years to the day when young Alice was murdered, why would they write a letter to the press and to Cross Duckworth's wife, proclaiming to be the murderer, but yet they're leaving the country. They simply signed the letters, the Witten murderer. 
So it's a bit bizarre why somebody would write these letters almost two years after the death of Alice Barnes. Now this crime and the murder of Alice Barnes, it's one of those which raises a lot of questions. You've got allegations of corruption within the police force at the time and setting somebody up who may well have been innocent. You've also got witness testimonies. The police based a lot of their evidence on the witnesses of young children or the testimonies of young children. How reliable are young children? After all, Cross Duckworth did admit to being on the bridge and in and around Witton at the time and on the day of the murder. Doesn't mean he's a murderer, but these young children identified him from a police lineup. You've also got inconsistencies with the police reports themselves and you've also got the Hawks, or if you want to call them the Hawks letters, that arrived two years later. Now okay, at the time of the murders and the investigation, these letters hadn't been received so the police could only go off what they had at the time. But you've got the inconsistencies as we're saying, such as the handkerchief which many people will have had in and around Blackburn at that period. You've got the, 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 the prints, and I've mentioned this a few times, but you've got the boot prints, which crossed up with admitted that he'd been in the area that day, if not the days leading up to the, the, the crime. So you've got all these inconsistencies, which in this present day, I highly doubt will be enough to convict somebody of murder. It'd be difficult to prove otherwise, but still to find somebody guilty of murder and then to sentence them to death on a lot of inconsistencies it really does make this case even more bizarre. Now another interesting fact about this case, poor Alice Barnes, is that it came pretty much hot on the heels of two other, two other crimes, one famous throughout the country, if not the world, and the other more locally, again in Blackburn. First of all, you had Emily Holland, who was brutally murdered by William Fish, I think it was around 1876. So the Alice Barnes murder came less than 20 years after that. And the Blackburn, or the people of Blackburn, they were still reeling from the William Fish murder of Emily Holland. But then we had the Jack the Ripper murders, didn't we, in 1888. And the whole country at that point was living in fear. And a lot of people and a lot of press reports at the time wrote about the Ripper possibly leaving London and relocating further northwards. So some people were still living under the dark shadow of the Ripper murders. And obviously when Alice Barnes's body was sadly found, this kind of heightened those fears even more. So the 1800s, the late 1800s especially, were quite dark and none more so than here in the northwest of England. That is all from here in Boulderstone and the fabulous location of St. Leonard's Church. Tell me your thoughts down below if you've heard this story or if you've got an idea as to who the actual culprit may have been. Was it crossed up with? After all, all the evidence seems to point to him. Or could these two letters that were received by the press and crossed up with his wife actually be real? Let me know your thoughts down below. But in the meantime, guys, I want you to take care of yourselves, stay safe, Always stay curious, and in the meantime, we will be coming back soon with more tales from a dark but at times glorious past. Take care, everybody.